This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship here at the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. We are so glad that you are joining us today. Please join me now in our responsive call to worship. Let us give thanks to the Lord with our whole hearts. Great, Great are the works of the Lord. God's righteousness endures forever. The works of God's hands are faithful and just. God is gracious and merciful. The Lord is ever mindful of God's covenant. Knowing that we serve a God who is full of grace and mercy, let us come together on our prayer of confession, followed by a time of silent prayer, and then our assurance of pardon. Let us pray. O oh God, we puff ourselves up with accumulated knowledge, but without love for you, we have no wisdom. We take advantage of the liberty you give us through grace and become bad examples to our sisters and brothers. We alternate between fear of your authority and denial of your authority. We dread to face our demons, and we are faithless in the presence of your power over them. Save us, Lord, from the sins we know. Save us, Lord, from the sins that we hide. By the power of your Holy Spirit, Lead us in living redeemed lives as we strive faithfully to follow the wisdom and authority of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
The God who made you and knows your every thought hears you now and forgives you all of your sin. We have been redeemed through Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who is Alpha and Omega, all in all. Thanks be to God. Good morning. Have you ever asked your parents if you could do something and they say no to you and you say, why? And they say, because I said so. Well, I know as a mom, I said that to my children many, many times over the years. Now, it was usually after they had been bugging me for a long time because they didn't like the reasons that I kept giving them for, the, for why they couldn't do something. And so finally I just said, because I said so. Now, your parents don't say this to you to be mean, and they don't say it to be unfair. Usually, your parents say this to you because there's a good reason. And the reason might be that whatever it is you're asking to do might be unsafe, or it just might not work out into the family schedule, whatever it is you wanted to do. Now, this is hard sometimes, but you have to listen to your parents. They're the authority and they're in control. Now, in our Bible story today, we hear about a time when Jesus is in a synagogue, which is like a church, and he's teaching about God. A man is possessed by an evil spirit, and Jesus commands it to come out of the man, and it does. The people are amazed that Jesus is even able to have authority over unclean spirits. Jesus has been put in charge by God. He's the most important teacher of all. He wants what is best for us, just like your parents want what's best for you. God has a plan for us. It will give us hope and a bright future, but for the plan to work, we need to listen to Jesus. Jesus is in control. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for sending Jesus to teach us. Help us to listen and learn about you so that we can live our best life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please join me in our unison prayer for illumination. Holy Spirit, your people call out for understanding. Bring to our yearning hearts and minds the truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's reading is Psalm 111. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. In the company of the upright in the congregation, Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of honor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. A reading from the book of Mark. They went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The season after the Epiphany, in the Revised Common Lectionary, the schedule of scripture readings we follow, focuses on getting to know Jesus. It highlights some of the most important traits of our Messiah and his ministry. 
Three weeks ago, we met Jesus at his baptism, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit and publicly named as God's beloved. Then, through the call story of Philip and Nathaniel, we added the knowledge that Jesus pursues and finds us. He knows us as intimately as the God who created us, and he acts as our ladder back to God. Last week, as Jesus called Simon, Andrew, James, and John, we witnessed Jesus' magnetism, a man with a calling so compelling that these four men dropped their nets and immediately followed him. We also heard what many scholars identify as Jesus' mission statement within the Gospel of Mark. Chapter 1, verse 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This week, Mark tells us about Jesus' first public act. And like all first impressions in life and in narrative, it tells us a lot. We're meant to sit up and take notice. First and foremost, we learn that Jesus carries a unique and significant authority. He enters the synagogue on the Sabbath to teach and astonishes his listeners by communicating his message as one having authority beyond anything to which they're accustomed. He bears no title or educational pedigree, as do the scribes who are the traditional holders of authority in this place. But he has a certain something that captures people's attention. We do not get to hear what he says or how he says it. We do not know if he's especially charismatic or a spectacular orator, probably because it's immaterial. Gifted speech is not the source of the authority he commands. Rather, Jesus bears the palpable quality of someone intimately connected to God. As he says in the Gospel of John, Jesus is the shepherd, and the sheep know the sound of his voice. Those gathered in the synagogue that day heard from the mouth of a stranger a voice they knew at the core of their beings, a voice that, as a people deeply formed in faith, they knew to follow, and they were amazed. Here was a new authority that was also as old as time itself. Now, authority is rather a tricky, touchy subject for us today, I think. On the one hand, as followers of Christ, we confess Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life, our preeminent authority in heaven and on earth. The Presbyterian Book of Order says, in affirming with the earliest Christians that Jesus is Lord, the church confesses that he is its hope and that the church as Christ's body is bound to his authority and thus free to live in the lively, joyous reality of the grace of God. We intend to hold Jesus as the principal guiding force in our lives, above all else, so we may be truly free. On the other hand, the vast majority of us in the church today came of age in the midst of the postmodernism of the latter half of the 20th century. Postmodernism introduced a broad skepticism into our culture that continues to flourish. It broke apart, decentralized and relativized truth and taught us to question authority rather than simply follow it. Through postmodernism, we heard and benefited from a fuller diversity and multiplicity of voices within the human family. But we lost some common ground and a unifying narrative. At the same time, the explosion of the internet, social media, and the 24-hour news cycle has given us unprecedented access to, well, everything. Now we are bombarded with a thousand streams of influence and potential authority every day. We consume a steady diet of information, misinformation, facts, opinion posing as fact, spin, sensationalism, and the self-affirming echo chambers of our personal social media feeds, 
all confusingly mashed up together. And this is true to one extent or another, regardless of the sites and sources we frequent, whether conservative, liberal, or anywhere in between. So our relationship to authority and truth has gotten pretty complicated if we're honest with ourselves. Therefore, I think this text invites us to check in with ourselves on how we're doing with listening for and to the one having authority. How are we relating to Jesus and his authority within our lives? As we do each week through our prayer of confession, we benefit from taking a regular spiritual inventory so we can reorient ourselves as needed. More voices clamor for our attention than probably ever before in human history. And as we live within that noise, we need to ask ourselves exactly who and what are we allowing to disciple us today? Who and what are we allowing to inform and form us, to influence us, to shape our understanding and our commitments? Are we spending enough time with the shepherd that we will recognize his voice from among all the rest? How are we sorting everything we're hearing? And how do we even begin to know who and what to trust? This brings me to the second major thing we learn about Jesus in this passage from Mark. He has come to oppose the forces of evil and to liberate God's children from anything that would rob us of all that God hopes and intends for us. As his first act to proclaim and demonstrate the kingdom of God, Jesus casts out an unclean spirit. The one possessed with the Holy Spirit who restores us to God, heals a man possessed by an evil spirit that pulls him away from God. Jesus shows the authority the worshipers heard in his teaching by silencing this demon. Then he sets the man free from an impossible bondage and opens the way for him to lead a new life filled with a new spirit, the Holy Spirit. We may or may not believe in literal demons, but we certainly understand what it is to be possessed by things that pull us away from God. It could be anger, fear, hatred, or envy, self-loathing, pride, or prejudice, an addiction or depression, workaholism or despair, affluenza or greed. Jesus, in his authority, silences all these spirits that seek only to curse, tear down, and destroy. He casts them out and frees us from their bondage. He opens the way for new life, filled with a new spirit, to grow within us. This story gives us a primary test by which to weigh those voices vying for our attention and for authority over our lives. Do they oppose evil and seek to liberate all God's children? Or do they promote bondage and pull us away from God and God's will for us? Do they bless, build up, and create? Or do they curse, tear down, and destroy? Do they foster life or perpetuate death? We live in a noisy world filled with forces, both internal and external, that try to lure us away from God. They tell us all kinds of sweet-sounding lies, including that they can coexist with the life of faith we have chosen. The man with the unclean spirit was inside the synagogue during worship, after all. Fortunately, Jesus' voice of authority cuts through the din if only we open our ears to hear it. He calls to us to remember the liberating ways of the kingdom. He stands ready to silence the unclean spirits that still plague us. And he has the power to lead us through the mess into a new unbound life. Thanks be to God. Amen. Wow, we certainly live in an exciting 
and frustrating time. As we begin the year with the anticipation of hope and the return to some level of normalcy, we are keenly aware that 2020 was a challenge on many levels. For most of us, this past year has been one of unimaginable loss. The loss runs the gamut from an abrupt interruption of our usual routine and connections with those close to us, to the loss of financial security or the death of a friend or family member. No matter the degree of loss, you may be ex experiencing bouts of anxiety, loneliness, anger, frustration, or even grief. You may be dealing with these feelings, additionally, without the aid of your usual support system. The Presbyterian Church of Morristown Stephen Ministers would like to remind you that you don't need to go through these feelings alone. We are trained and ready to walk alongside you as you deal with your own version of loss. We offer one-on-one -on -one support, prayer, and comfort for those going through a difficult time. If you or someone you know could benefit from a Stephen Minister relationship, please don't hesitate to contact the Reverend Sarah Green, Lois Hollenfeld, or me, Jim Wood. The contact information is provided online each week. To summarize, I would like to share with you a few words from the late Bill Withers' popular song, Lean On Me. You just might have a problem that I'll understand. We all need someone to lean on. Lean on me. Thank you. Now let us present to God our lives and our offerings, grateful for the gifts that we have been given even in these pandemic times. I invite you to give to God through the ministry of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. You may find information on giving at pcmorristown.org. And now let us pray. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Let us pray for the needs of the world. We pray for the healing of earth and all its creatures. We pray for healing in mind, body, and circumstance. We pray for the church's willingness to cast out demons in its midst. We pray for the healing of divisions between followers of Jesus Christ. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for leaders of nations, we pray for those who have great wealth, for those who have too much power. We pray for those who have none. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We pray for children who cry out for food and shelter. We pray for parents who cannot provide for their children's needs. We pray for peacemakers and for diplomats, for philanthropists. We pray for those who use the law to make policies for the greater good. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We pray this day for those who are in pain and in need of care, especially those we name now in the silence of our hearts. We pray for the wisdom to fear you rightly, for the resilience to withstand change, for the ability to give thanks for the people who have shaped our lives. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Into your hands we commend all those for whom we pray and those it would be easy to forget. We ask your blessing on all your peoples that we may come at last to the truth around your banquet table that has no end. We pray all this in and through Christ, 
who taught us when we pray to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. as you go in peace. May you be guided, uplifted, and blessed by the grace-filled authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the powerful presence of the Holy Spirit, this day and forevermore. Amen.